Thanks for having me here. Yeah, so uh, let's start in this, into the second part of the uh, awesome event here. I'm really, really happy to be here. Uh, I actually have to admit that I was quite um, well surprised that uh, Alex wanted to have me here. So I'm Christina Eckleder and I work for Comsisto. Um, and actually, most likely you know us as a developing company. So we do a lot of things and we do UX. So. Um, a couple of, uh, well, it's basically more like one and a half years ago, Comsisto decided to like, have a broad portfolio of stuff that you can hand over to a customer to really have good products in the end. So um, my background is first and foremost technically. So I started computer science and then I went over to the design stuff. So I did a lot of um, conceptual design and UX research. And then I really felt the urge to get back to the geeky stuff. And that's why I went to Consisto, because there I can do both. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a product that we have, but that's just like to give you a frame. So it's called TeamGeist.io. So everything that I'm talking about is a little bit, a little bit wrapped around that. Um, and it's basically an application to manage vacation. Um, so what is UX research? There's a lot of rumors about that. One is, you need to have a psychologist for that. You need to have a lab for that. And you need to have at least 20 people for that. And, oh my god, that sounds complicated and expensive. So what is UX research? Basically, UX research is everything that you do to find out who the heck is using your product. So that's ranging from, like, log file analysis to uh, personas, A-B testing, and click testing, and also the stuff that is uh, commonly known as UX research, that's usability studies. Who, who in this room conducted or had the opportunity to watch a user experience test? Wow, pretty amazing. So who is frequently working with a UX person, design or research? Okay, now it's getting uh, less. <laughs> How many of those UX researchers the researchers or designers actually know how to code. Oh, cool. That's pretty good, amazing. So um, with UX research, we're facing some problems. And that's mainly because UX research is done in the wrong phase of a project. So if you just look at these waves, you usually do a lot of UX research at the beginning of a project. So you might wonder why. Um, and then there's this slight steep increase at the end. That's probably because some people start to panic. Did we do the right thing? Is the user going to accept it? And the reason why it's still that way in Germany is actually because of this thing. And don't worry, I'm not going to put it, keep it up for long. So it's the hated waterfall model, where you um, try to get all the requirements up front and then just rush through like building a house and at the end you figured out that you forgot the cellar or the, uh, well, the roof. Then there are some more um, modern concepts. One is the one that user experience designers always try to embrace people on. It's a lovely called user experience, uh, user-centered design process. And as much as I like it, it's a four, um, four step iterative process, um, it's hard to get that into real big companies because they really don't like iterating because they have like due dates and marketing campaigns and stuff like that. So basically the first step, the one on the top, is um, where you try to figure out what the context of use is. Then you would uh, specify those requirements, build a prototype, and then do research and what you gain from the research you put back in into the whole circle and start over. Basically there's another process which basically looks the same. It's called Lean UX um, and is part of the, the Lean movement. But if you just glimpse at it, it's basically the same. Just that um, they admit that the first phase is declare assumptions. So whether in a user-centered design process you really think that you can grasp the um, user, 
And then in UX, you just have assumptions and then you test them. So let's get back to what research act, uh, UX research actually is. Um, it is indeed all of these, what's in the bubbles here. So you can do a lot of things for UX research. And today, we're just focusing on three, basically. So it's a classic usability study. It's the um, automated testing and remote testing. So why that if you have all these wonderful possibilities? Because, because to be frank, you're not going to get all the big bubbles into your project. So and I really want to focus on stuff that you can do, really can do. So um, once I used to have a lab, and a lab is cool. But a lab is also expensive. And if you put in an eye tracker, which is a pretty cool device, um, you need to justify the cost. And that's going to be a lot of work. So um, I'm going to give you a recipe. I'm going to talk about what gear you really need, what documents you need to have, what a test plan is, what kind of locations you can use or improvise on, and where to get the participants from. So let's start out with the gear stuff. And that strongly depends on what you're um, testing. So um, if it is digital, it's probably a notebook and a webcam. If it's mobile, it's probably a whatever recording device and the, um, the mobile device. You definitely need a microphone and you need a, a recording tool. I can recommend ScreenFlow for Mac, but there are multiple other versions uh, and possibilities. For paper prototypes, it's basically kind of the same setup, but you need to have an external camera to put it on to your prototypes because they are not on the screen. Um, and I recommend to have a tripod. That makes things a lot easier. And there are also tool-wise, there are also um, tools for Windows. And what I really, really want you to take care of is you need a consent form. That sounds a little bit odd because we just, yeah, you know, think that people really are, have, are willing to participate, but a consent form is what you need from the law perspective. Without a consent form, you're pretty much up to trouble because you're collecting personal data and maybe people might change their um, ideas. So what needs, uh, what basically needs to be in a consent form is information about you and your company or the company you're working for. Um, and that's mainly the address and the name. Then, and that sounds odd, but it is uh, really important. You need to have a declaration of voluntary participation. So that, that is something that even um, a lawyer once asked me why I have that in a consent form. So the problem is you're handing money over to the participant. Um, and there might be the impression that you force them to do something. Um, you're not, I hope you're not going to do that, but uh, just, to be sure, uh, just to be safe, have a declaration of voluntary participation in it, please. And also terms of revocation. So if people change their minds and they really don't want you to have their personal data anymore, they need to know how to revoke. And the privacy policy, of course. So you're collecting data, you're collecting videos, maybe survey data. So uh, participants need to know how long it is stored, um, what is rec recorded, and who has access to those data. Um, I have a short example in German. It basically says that the, the person is uh, aware that he's recorded and that he is here from, of, on his own will and that he has the possibility to withdraw his data from the study at any point of time without consequences. So you could add an NDA. And in a lab study, that's probably also a good idea. But when it comes to more practical approaches that I'm going to talk of, about, um, I wouldn't recommend so. Because that's putting you up for like, yeah, questioning. So if you go, for instance, into a, um, a coffee shop and you say, OK, I want, to, I want to have your opinion on the stuff that I'm working on, on the app or something like that, and I'm going to show it to you and 
we are in public. And you ask them to um, basically not talk about it in public. That's a little bit weird. So um, consider the NDA part. So now we have the legal stuff. And we already know that we want to do a study. What else do we need? Um, since we're in the, well, um, agile world, you might consider, oh, I rush off and just do the study. And please don't. <laughs> because that will be, um, each interview that you're going to do is going to be different. And you're never going to have a solid answer to your questions afterwards. So what you really need is a test plan. And that basically contains of everything that you're going to ask, everything that you're going to explain, and um, all the details for the tasks that you're going to moderate. And also the question is, there's a common setup that you do an initial questionnaire at the beginning, just basically asking people a little bit about themselves to open them up. So like, okay, do you work with product X, Y? Um, do you use um, cloud services often? How do you manage your um, vacation? Um, and there usually is a questionnaire at the end that's wrapping up the experience. Oops, sorry. So like, um, did you like the product? What did you like most? What do you think could we improve? Things like that. With questions, always have in mind that they should be open. Do you, li do you like the product is um, a good question for people to keep talking. Um, do you think the product is cool is a quite bad question for two reasons. First, everybody, else, everybody considers cool to be something different. And um, the second one is you probably get a yes, no, or maybe. And that's not what you want to know. You really want to know how the uh, participant perceived your product or your app. Um, the other thing is also with questions, um, if you're asking for habits or what people do frequently, have in mind that there is something called social bias. So. Um, who among you is doing sports regularly? Raise your hat. So, good question, right? Uh, might be that somebody raised his hand because he knows that sport, doing sports is good for health and health is something that is promoted in our society. Might also be that somebody does, well, consider frequently once a year. So, keep those things in mind. Better ask like things like, um, when was the last time that you actually hit the gym? So, when it comes to tasks, I mean, you really want people to do something in your web app or in, uh, in the product. Um, there are some basic rules for tasks as well. So, uh, they need to be meaningful. <laughs> so, they should be solvable. That sounds quite odd, maybe, because you maybe have like a prototype and not everything is already finished. But nothing is worse than a task that cannot be fulfilled by a participant, especially when it is the first one that they are doing. Because in, in Germany, uh, especially, people tend to consider not solving a task as something that is their fault. So you're setting people up in a really, really bad mood. And unless you really want to challenge that, like something, how do people react when they are like desperate and still need to work with my application? I wouldn't do so. So keep in mind that tasks need to be solvable and that they should be phrased neutrally. So avoid things like, now we're going to do a very easy task. So easy for whom? Now we're going to do something quick. So, because you don't know what's easy for a person and what's quick. Um, also, you should contain all information that are necessary for the task. So, if you have a task that is a lock-on task, make sure that the participant knows the credentials. Um, also, you should not contain any hints or other 
uh, remarks that could help the participant to solve a task. And um, you need to have a call to action phrase at the end. Otherwise, it's going to go like this. You state your request, what you want the user to do, and he says, hmm, am I supposed to do that now? And you're like, yeah, yeah, that was the idea of it. So I have an example, and it's a pretty bad one. So what you see here is the dashboard. You now want to use the search on top right to gain information about your colleague Mark. How would you do that? So this is a screenshot. So I already um, explained that this is the dashboard, so I cannot ask that later on. I also stated that there is a search function on the top right, and that we're searching for Mark. That we're searching for Mark is actually a good idea, because that's a task. <coughs> and there's a smarter way on to how to rephrase that. And that one is, you remember that you plan to meet with your colleague Mark tomorrow, you wonder if he will be in the office. What do you do to find out if he will be there? So that is very neutral. And actually, if we go back to the screenshot, there are multiple ways to actually achieve that task. So I could look at the, um, the week schedule with the recent absences. I could search for him in the search bar. Or I could like click on the team. That's the top part. Um, and if you state a way on how a user is supposed to, re, um, to gain information, you're never going to find out which way they actually would have taken. So be clear on that. Never give hints in the tasks themselves. If they're really, really stuck, you can give a hint. But make a note that you did so, because that is very, very important for the analysis. Okay. So now we covered what we need to have in a test plan. And um, the next question that also often is asked is, how many do I really know uh, need to have? So how many participants do I need to have in a study so that it is good? And we are quite lucky because we have like um, pros in the business and they uh, analyze things like that. One is Nielsen. And he did a study in 2000 that stated that with five participants, you're going to get 80% of the problems. The problem with that one is that it is the most misunderstood and most misquoted chart ever in history. Um, actually, the way that he gained that information is he did a major analysis of a lot of studies. And he counted the uh, amount, regardless of their value. So in, in this meta-analysis, he said, OK, well, yes, see, here is what we found out. Five participants, 80% of the problems. Um, that always was discussed quite controversially in the, um, in the business. And just in 2012, there came a new answer from Nielsen. And that was, the answer is five, except when it's not. Most arguments for using more test participants are wrong, but some tests should be bigger and some smaller. So it's like, yeah, you get five and everything's fine. Most of the time. There had been a more recent study on that um, from the University of Texas. And what they actually did is they did a, a test with 100 participants. I, I think a little bit more than 100. And they counted the findings, and then they did random assignments of five. Drew five out, figured out how much. And what I figured out actually was that he's not that wrong. So with five participants, you actually could get 80% of all the results, but you also could get like 30. So it's ranging from 30 to 80% of all problems found. But don't worry. If you only have money for five people, that's fine. Because what people kind of mess up in their heads is that we're not searching for the total amount of all problems. We are searching for the top 10 problems that we actually want to work on. And if you find them and fix them, your product will be so much better. And you don't care about the 15 that you probably missed and had not been so important. So don't worry. Um, 
So now we know that we need a couple of participants. Five would be good. So where actually would you get them from? How do you recruit? So um, one possibility is to recruit customers, but keep in mind that they're not neutral. A customer already knows your product. Unless you really want to know how existing customers are going to work with a product, don't go for customers, because they also tend to stick to the stuff that they already know. Um, you could use employees from different uh, departments or different teams that know that do not know the application very well. You could ask partners if they would be interested to send someone. Um, you, could do market, you could use a market research institute and pay for them. You could also um, just write that you're going to test on social networks. You could go to universities or panels. Um, or you could just recruit them from the street. Just, just depending on your criteria. It also depends on um, whether you have a certain target group or not. Um, so recruiting is essential, but if you just want to know if somebody could interact with your app, you might consider just not being too focused on your target group. Um, so now we need, still need a, a place to do so, right? So where could you do that? With a basic setup, you could do it basically everywhere. So a meeting room, a coffee shop, a restaurant, a library, a trade show, if it, trade shows, if it is very short. So people on trade shows are not in the mood of sitting there for half an hour for a uh, five euro uh, voucher or something like that. Um, who among those that had uh, exposure to user, user experience research had um, the researcher doing a coffee shop test. One, two, okay. Um, this is something that was a hype in, in like low cost UX research for quite a while. And there's a good quote from Laura Klein. Probably know her because she wrote um, some of the lean UX stuff. And she said, go outside, find a Starbucks. Other coffee shops are also acceptable if you refuse to go to Starbucks. Um, buy a $5 gift card, offer to buy people coffee, and spend five minutes looking at your product. Have a few tasks in mind that you want them to perform. Actually, I tried that in Munich. It was a quite interesting uh, experience. So um, I'm not sure if they let me in anymore. So. Um, <laughs> So here's the deal. Um, coffee shop testing in Germany is a little bit complicated. So ask upfront and keep in mind that um, coffee shop owners are a little bit suspicious. So um, list a couple of coffee shops in your area and go there, bring a test plan as an example and prepare some good and solid arguments. Why should some owner be interested in you doing that? What is his or her benefit? And how often do you want to run your tests there? Um, uh, I would just um, recommend finding some mom and pop coffee shops, so owner-run coffee shops, because they do not have any regulations from their mother company. Um, but basically, we are ready to go, right? We have a test plan. We know what we want to do. And maybe we already have a spot. So let's go. When you're doing that, you need to take care of something else when you're actually running the studies. And that's before the test, really prepare your prototypes, reset them after every run. Um, prepare your documents and questionnaires and make sure that you really have enough space and battery left for your next recording. Because nothing is worse than having a participant really stating this wonderful, awesome phrase about the product that you want to show your product manager, line manager, uh, marketing guy, and you're just not able to prove it because you lost the recording. So recruit the participants. And from my perspective, one thing that really worked well is preparing a small script. Because the first time is you're going to be a little bit, well, 
uh, challenged by talking to total strangers and really saying, hey, I want to test my product. Would you have the time to do so? So by just writing it out, you already have the key points in your mind. And then there's a study. You, you find some, found someone that you really want to um, interview and he or she has time. So during the study, just observe what people are doing um, and how they solve the task, which way they're going to take, what they're focusing on and what they're commenting. Ask them to think aloud. People tend to forget that because that's not what they're usually doing. So usually they're not going to their PC and saying, oh, I'm going to click on that icon because it looks fancy and now I'm going to move over here because I search for um, whatever function. So uh, make them verbalize what they're thinking because you cannot ask them later on. Um, also, um, please avoid measuring time because when people start verbalizing, it slows down their process. I mean, you can try that uh, at home. Just uh, open the dishwasher and explain your wife, girlfriend, boyfriend, um, what you're doing and why you're just retaining all the items in which way. So I bet you you're not going to make that dishwasher in five minutes. Um, also watch for changes in uh, gesture, posture, and mimics. Because they can um, give you valid hints when to ask questions. So um, I'm going to show you a short video about um, a, a usability test that we did on the TeamGeist app when we started out. So um, I will comment them a little bit because uh, we don't, we are not able to share the audio that well. Um, so I can give you a good hint, and that one is. The prototype that we had been testing was a little bit malfunctioning at that specific day. And it was not um, recognizing the dates that had been uh, fed into it, and it was not calculating the, um, the amount of vacation days needed to have that vacation. So let's see. I can get something out of you. So the task is actually that they would want to uh, book vacation around Christmas time. And uh, she is... Um, Okay, I'm going to pass um, shortly. So she, she already struggled with the first field because she, she read a rare person and she was not sure is it her manager or not. That's a, um, it's just a label that's wrong. So um, just a quick question, who is for manager? Do, you, do I need to put in my manager here? Nobody. Okay, do I need to put in the person that is going to take care of my stuff when I'm at home, uh, at vacation? Okay, one. <laughs> so actually, all the others that did not have an opinion right at that point, neither did we. So in our own company, uh, we actually really put in people, ooh, ten, <laughs> good, put in people that um, need to um, cover our projects. But in other companies, it could be um, a, a boss or something. Um, so I'm going to skip the rest of the video. I'm just going to tell you what we also, uh, what we also find out. So the next thing, um, maybe I can just run it. She is um, going to use the form in a very odd way. So she's moving up to the right for start of the day, and then she's going to move left. And usually that's not the way how we interact with interfaces usually, because we read from left to right, and that's the way that we should fill out forms. So 
be careful and look at the details just because it makes sense for you or it does stack nicely in the mobile version. This is not how you should design an interface. So let's get back to, um, to the slides. Um, Once you recorded all your participants, you need to analyze it. And um, the professionals spend a lot of time doing that. But there are ways that are easy and not that time consuming. So watching the videos and just do um, plain old post-it stickers. Group them, photograph them, you're done. Another one actually is a Google uh, rainbow spreadsheet. Just Google rainbow spreadsheet, you're going to find that one. It's pretty neat because you can see the, um, uh, the, the frequencies, how many of my participants actually did that. So, and afterwards you actually reached your destination. How cool is that? You did your first test. And now you might consider something like, yeah, Christina, you're completely right, but there has just no time. I cannot spend a whole half day doing UX research. Is there something else? Possibly something where I don't need to leave the office. So yes, there is. You're not off the hook yet. You could do this actually via Skype or any other hangout, any other screen sharing product, uh, video, um, VC product. So here is the trick. You actually need to recruit your participants upfront. That's the only thing that changes. Another thing is participants are going to use their own hardware. And you might think that's a cool idea. Actually, that is a cool idea, but it's also a very challenging idea because you might figure out that people just don't have the hardware you expected them to have, or they have a very slow internet connection or something else. Um, and there's also the uh, video conference system in between, so that could lead to a tougher situation. The advantage actually is that you have potentially way more people to draw your, um, to recruit your participants from. Now you're going to say, yeah, good, Christina, fine. But actually, I do not like to talk to people. <laughs> is there something UX research wise that I still could do? Well, yes, you could. And that is, uh, it used to, it still is a hype thing. So automated UX testing. And there are a lot of companies doing that, and there's good reason for that. So you could do that too. Um, the problem here is you cannot ask anything. So you need to prepare everything well in the beginning. So everything that you would like to ask needs to be in the questionnaires, in the tasks. Depending on um, the person who is going to give you uh, who's going to, to offer you the service, you might be able to get screen recordings. That's a top thing. But you also just might get survey answers and, and free text fields, things like that. Um, the advantage is actually that you could have your results the same day. The disadvantage is that you need a lot of people for that test. There are studies that state that you can get the equal amount and quality of um, results. But actually keep in mind that they always compare an 8 to 12 user in-lab survey with a 80 to 100 person study that is done automated. So there are many ways in how to learn from your clients and customers. Get out there and just try it on your own. And I think we still have some minutes left to answer some questions, right? Whoa. <laughs> um, any questions to uh, Christina's talks? Uh, how did you deal with branding preconception? I remember when I used for Yahoo, I, we, we showed something as Yahoo and then we showed something without a logo and the results were completely different. 
So is this something you encounter as well? Is it something that it's a best practice not to do at all, to remove branding? What's the, the way? Also, paper prototyping, good idea, not good idea? Okay, now we have two questions, okay. Okay, the branding question first. So the question basically was, is branding affecting my results? Yes, it is. So people have a strong mental model about companies, ASICs and stuff. Um, depends on what you want to gain as an information. So if you want to have like the brand influence, in, influence insight, just as keyword as the brand product. Um, if you want to be neutral, remove it. So I did both. Paper prototyping works. That was the other question. Should I do paper prototyping? Was it right? Um, you definitely should, but here's a big but. Um, it is a completely different feeling for the um, participant because you're going to tell them, look, we are going to do something on paper and that is an idea and you can just like tell us what you like and we even could draw things. Um, so they are not going to perceive it as real as a product. I did a lot of paper prototyping and also in uh, high quality paper prototypes with real screen designs. Um, I recommend doing them, but I also recommend to be a little bit careful with them because you definitely should do real tests with the real product in a realistic uh, environment. So, and one thing, <laughs> to take uh, a good thought about. Whenever a participant is drawing something on paper, don't take it too seriously. Ask, to your, desi ask your designer, he has a lot of experience in designing products. And just because some participants draw something on paper, it does not mean that it fits to the whole uh, target group that you're having. And by far, they're not skilled in designing. So keep it as a hint, but don't take it too seriously. Any other questions? Um, if you get uh, contradicting feedback, like uh, the one uh, group says, oh, if I click it and it turns green, it's completely surprising, and the other group says, oh, if I click it and it turns purple, it's completely surprising, um, how, how would you manage that? Or, or, um, what would be the big reaction if, if uh, things are contradicting when you test with people? Okay, so the question was, what do I do if half of my participants say, yeah, that's cool, and the others say, oh, no, not so much. Um, well, test further. So, and if you have the chance and chance and it is an online product, do A B testing. Because you reach far out you reach out far further and you have statistics on that. Keep keep those things in mind because I had them a lot. And sometimes it's not the concrete the, the real issue, but it's something else. So maybe you also might to re try to rephrase your questions for the next round. And just keep it in mind and test further. Any, oh, one more question? Okay. Last, last. last one. Okay, last question. I think I have you got any experience with uh, Mechanical Turk, like outsourcing it to a cloud platform, like the, oh. the one from Amazon? Because you can get like a million of people for a couple of dollars. So the question is, if I do have um, experiences with like large-scale automat test, automated testing, right? No, no, uh, because you're outsourcing it to a crowd. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, outsourcing the whole test to a crowd. Um, yeah, I do have experiences with that. And there are moments when you really want to do that. One thing actually, from my perspective, is quality assurance. It's a completely different thing if you want to do quality assurance or UX testing. Because um, what, you're going to, what you're going to realize is that they give you answers to something that you really didn't ask for. So something like, oh, that's spelled wrong. 
when you really wanted to test like the interaction and the flow. So just always consider what, I'm, what do you want to learn from that study? Do I need millions of people trying my app? Or do I want to have quality feedback of a few of them that I actually can ask? So always try to find out what's your question that you're having in mind. And maybe even write that out, because it's, make it, it's going to make your question, the, this, the thing that you really want to inquire, a much, much, more, much clearer. And then pick the right method. Good. Christina, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christina.